Hello and welcome. My name is Aaron Stein, Director of the Middle East Program at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia, and you are listening to the Middle East Brief, a podcast focused on developments in the Middle East and why they matter for U.S. foreign policy. Be sure to subscribe to the Middle East Brief on iTunes and Spotify and sign up to receive FPRI's weekly insights newsletter, where a link to the show will be delivered every two weeks straight to your inbox at www.fpri.org. Hello and welcome. Uh, today, uh, for the FPRI podcast, we have a, a three-person panel uh, with Michael Kaufman, the director of the Russia Studies Program at CNA, the Center for Naval Analysis, and Jack Watling, a research fellow for land warfare at the Royal United Services Institute uh, in London, uh, and Rob Lee, a PhD uh, candidate at King's College in London, although I think you are in the east coast of the United States at the moment, correct? That's right. Well, welcome everybody to the show. Um, today, um, you know, each one of you, um, in your own way, has you know contributed analysis that I have followed and really enjoyed about the ongoing conflict in the in Nagorno-Karabakh that involves forces from both Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, as of recording, we are in the fourth week of this conflict, uh, and despite multiple, I would say, well, multiple efforts to try and reach a ceasefire, uh, the two sides, at least at the at the moment of recording, do not have have not suggested any really indications that they are willing to abide by it or that they see an end to the fighting. That obviously could change, uh, but that's where we're at now. Um, Mike, I wanted to come to you first because you wrote sort of a great primer and a good piece for War on the Rocks, uh, which is a friend of the podcast, um, you know, about the complex. Maybe you could summarize your piece and I'll, I'll, I'll head on over to Jack after that because he wrote a similar piece for Rusi. So, so Mike, you're, you're up first. Yeah, sure. Uh, I and uh, my colleague Laney, we tried to briefly sort of do a bit of an operational campaign analysis of what's happened in the conflict and the course of the war for the first two weeks. Some of that has held into the subsequent two weeks, not all of it. And it just would basically discuss the uh, offensive that was launched by Azerbaijan on September 27th to essentially reclaim uh, both not just uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, but the seven outerlying districts of sort of buffer space that Armenian forces control and have de facto controlled for uh, almost 30 years of what has been internationally recognized as technically Azerbaijani territory. Um, and this offensive essentially uh, has a couple phases, and I, I can discuss them what we knew back then, which was first a, an attempt to conduct a thrust in, in the south, by Azerbaijani forces, which was principally not successful, and then a second vector to the north, trying to jut into Nagorno-Karabakh, which uh, I think traded uh, quite a bit in terms of material for a very small number of kilometers gained, which then led uh, Azerbaijani forces to engage in a sustained uh, drone campaign to essentially take out uh, any Armenian forces they could find, tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, air defense systems, and the like. It wasn't a systematic uh, suppression or destruction of air defense campaign, but they really went along the lines of the line of control. And they started using long range, uh, multiple uh, uh, launch rocket systems, high caliber and tactical SRBMs as well towards the end of the first week. And it looked like they were trying to interdict ground lines of communication, but they're also firing into the, the capital of Nagorno-Karabakh as well. So sort of a mix of targets. And then as we get into week two, what we really see is um, you know, Armenians suffered losses in a counteroffensive in the first week, primarily to Azerbaijani drones. These are pretty um, uh, pretty complex strikes. Not all of them are simply sort of uh, Turkish TB2s that Azerbaijan had acquired, but also a lot of Israeli loitering munitions and combinations of sort of sensors and shooters involved in the strikes. In general, I think it's very fair to say that Azerbaijan enjoys both a quantitative and a qualitative advantage over Armenia. Um, that's very notable in this conflict, right? That this is not at all two equally matched forces, and these are not all forces that are even kind of fighting with technology from the same decades or time periods. And you can especially see that, perhaps Jack will comment on it, in the matchup between poor ancient sort of Armenian modernized air defense. And uh, this is my own personal view that it wasn't much of a discovery that um, Israeli loitering munitions or Turkish drones uh, cannot be effectively dealt by uh, air defense systems deployed by the Soviet Union in 1971, even if you modernize them at the end of the day. You know, this is not a major discovery for military sciences that, 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 that the technology that dated can't effectively deal with this problem. So I'll summarize that uh, the article basically saying 
it seemed clear that Azerbaijan turned to a war of attrition. They could not they could not achieve any major operational breakthrough in the first two weeks. They returned to the southeast of uh, of the campaign towards Jabril Fazuli, where the terrain was fairly open and the area was unpopular, so they can make good gains. And they started basically eating the elephant one by a time. They were making good progress. They eventually broke through as we look into week three and are now pushing up uh, to cut off the ground line of communications between Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia proper, right? They have essentially broken out, but their campaign is essentially mixed. Part of it is taking what territory they can get their hands on because Armenian forces are essentially retreating, giving up these positions. They can't hold up to them. So they're sort of increasing their territorial con control in order to deliver towns they've captured as gains, right, as a political victory. Another part of it, there does seem to be now uh, a real sort of um, operational objective to be able to get to a point where they can interdict the main road to the Nagorno-Karabakh capital, or at least get close enough to artillery to interdict it. At least that's the way it looks from the campaign. I will be very frank, in the first two or three weeks, it wasn't immediately obvious if the Azerbaijani military really had a theory of victory. And judging by the course of the campaign, it looks like they've kind of arrived to it, um, but not. But does it not start out as, as sort of two thrusts to isolate uh, Armenians or a sustained campaign against Armenian air defense or a sustained campaign for interdiction of ground lines of communication or anything like that? So it seems like the, it seems like they finally gotten there. But uh, conclusion is that look, Armenia has been very much on the wrong side of the attrition curve, and they've lost a tremendous amount of equipment. They're not going to be able to sustain us. I think that's been very obvious to everyone by week two of the conflict. And the second is that um, just uh, in the theater of operations, they're likely to get Nagorno-Karabakh cut off as we get into week five, five of this conflict. And that's going to spell largely the end of their military efforts. So I think they, they, they more or less face a military disaster. I think that's a reasonably fair assessment of where this is going to go. Jack, why don't you pick up from there, you know, building on, well, we'll link the pieces below in the show notes. So if you just look down, you can see both, uh, you know, Mike, Michael's piece and Jack's piece below. But why don't, Jack, why don't you pick up from there? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, broadly, I think my analysis very much tracks in terms of how the conflict has developed. Um, but I, I would perhaps put a slight difference in emphasis to Mike in the sense that I think uh, what we've seen is that first week, week and a half, uh, you had very heavy close contact battles which fixed uh, Armenian forces, forced uh, the Armenians to start reinforcing them. Um, and in that close fight consistently, the Armenians have held up and been pretty credible. But what we've seen is very, very persistent attrition taken out of contact um, as those units come through. And some of the strikes that have been launched have been deep strikes uh, that have been interdiction. So the Laura ballistic missile strike, for example, on the bridge, um, was clearly aimed at slowing down and restricting the capacity for the Armenians to uh, reinforce their front. And so what I think you've seen from that is quite predictable in the sense that Armenian uh, capacity to resist has, has collapsed to some extent as the conflict is protracted because close in the close battle, their units are being increasingly pressed. And therefore, we're seeing now the uh, Azeri forces breaking through and making more territorial gains. Um, and I think the thing for me that this highlights is that you look at that conceptually and it's air land battle, it's you know not a revolution in uh, military concepts at all. And yeah, you can look at this in very traditional ways and say, well, not hugely innovative. Um, but the flip side of that is that the Azeris spend you know a couple of billion dollars a year on their military. And what they're conducting is a fairly sophisticated uh, set of strikes for a military with that level of resourcing. Um, and I think, you know, on the one hand, you can look at that and say, well, uh, the ballistic missiles that they have are very small in number, but they f basically fly in the seam between what would be BMD and, and higher range air defenses. Um, the UAVs that they've been using, both Israeli and Turkish, um, have slightly longer range than most Shorad systems, um, but are quite low radar cross section and quite difficult to engage or not necessarily economical to engage for poorly networked, longer range SAM systems. Um, and therefore they have been able to achieve an effect disproportionate to the resource that they've put in. Um, which actually for the US and for great powers, China, US, Russia, I, I don't think that um, that highlights a massive threat because 
all three of those states are, have the resources to pursue really effective layered air defenses. We can debate the extent to which the U.S. has that in place, but Russia definitely does. Um, and the U.S. has the mass with its air force, obviously, to, to roll over something like that. The, the countries that are going to really struggle are countries like France, the U.K., Germany, if it started to do anything expeditionary, um, who have to make really severe resource trade-offs about what they prioritize. Uh, and do they prioritize you know, interception of the high-end threat, or do they prioritize what could be quite a mass threat, in which case you need quite cheap interdiction uh, to preserve your forces. But at the same time, you know, you can't afford to invest in all the layers. Um, and so I think this kind of highlights how whether it's uh, Azerbaijan or the Houthis or the Iranians, we're seeing more and more actors being able to inflict strikes uh, that kind of work their way between the seams of what we would need to confront what we would previously have considered a sub-peer adversary. Uh, and a, a peer adversary, um, which is, is going to constrain our freedom of operation, I suppose, in, in expeditionary terms. Um, and for us in the UK, that's a, a particular concern. Um, the other thing I'd flag that just as a point of interest is I, I just came back today from Exercise Autonomous Warrior, which is the um, series of exercises that the British Army uses to try and work out how it integrates new UAVs, autonomous systems, this kind of thing. And we tie ourselves up in knots around, well, this can be countered, this can be disrupted, this capability needs to be integrated into our command and control systems, etc. Which, if we're talking about peer conflict, peer level conflict is absolutely right. But there is an extent to which you can achieve a lot just by employing this capability. Um, and, you know, the, Azerbaijan has demonstrated that it can get a significant level of operational overmatch from relatively limited amounts of investment in uh, you know, systemically resourcing um, certain capabilities. So I, I, think, I think it highlights uh, some lessons learned in terms of uh, how we need to think about modernization and also some of the, I'd say, rebalancing of threats on the modern battlefield. Rob, why don't you uh, pick up from there for some lessons learned that you've sort of pulled out for, for the U.S., um, you know, picking up on where, where Jack left off. Well, that was fascinating, by the way, about you know, looking beyond the U.S., Russia, and great powers. And then, uh, Mike, I saw you stick your finger up uh, for, for an intervention, and we'll come to you right after that. So, Rob, take it away. Yeah, so one thing before I get into that, um, I think what, one thing that's important to, to, <clears throat> to mention in the fighting going on now in September is you look at the previous flare-ups between Armenia and Azerbaijan, um, including in July and in uh, 2016 was the, the, the other big kind of you know four-day conflict. Um, Azerbaijan is doing some things differently this time, and uh, at least in my opinion, a lot of that is due to Turkey, right? So partially, um, you know, I, I at least think that Turkey is likely operating the TB2 uh, UCAVs that are that are most making most of these videos. Um, the Russian newspaper Kommersant had a report about. Um, you know, how, the, the number of Turkish soldiers, servicemen that are supposed to be in Azerbaijan. Allegedly, they are uh, conducting a lot of the C2 for Azerbaijan's efforts. But a lot of things that they're doing is, is quite different when you look at what happened in July. And so in July, um, Azerbaijan had you know, mostly the same weapons they have now, you know, aside from the TB2. And yet the fighting there was, which, which happened uh, um, north of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, along the border, um, but basically, it was it was a pretty ineffective uh, fight where you know both sides shelled each other. Neither side really had much success, and uh, there there was some big protests in Baku, and it, it didn't uh, it didn't seem as though Azerbaijan had achieved anything that it wanted to, and, and they weren't able to translate all this defense spending into any kind of success on the battlefield. And now you you've seen that change, you know, only two months later. And and so you know, first of all, I think part of that is is I think that's as part of that is, is the role of Turkey. I think part of it is. They're, they're going after different targets and they're using different kind of uh, um, uh, measures than they were back then. And it's having quite a big, a big effect. Um, so I think that's, that's part one thing that hit on uh, up front. Um, in terms of what we're seeing in the military front, it's a lot of it is a it's a look at things that are old and new. And and it's, you know, all, you know, most of the videos we're seeing from Azerbaijan are made from these TV 2 UCAVs that, that Turkey makes. That you know, allegedly Turkey exported to to Azerbaijan in September or August, sometime you know last month or two, which is why I think they're they're likely being operated by Turkish crews. Um, they're you know they're the 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 kind of the high level kind of uh, uh, thing being used, but it's important to also note that you know they, yes they are destroying a lot of Armenian equipment, 
Um, they're striking a lot of tanks. They strike a lot of MRS, air defense systems, other things. Um, but there's also a lot of limitations about what they can and can't do. And you know, one of the interesting things to me is that as much as we're talking about modern warfare, um, a lot of the things that you can you can negate those things or um, that you know even with air power, air power ultimately still has limitations. And so TB2, they can't seize terrain for you. TB2 can't negate high ground when you know, Armenians have defensive positions on high ground. They can't negate that from you. Um, what the TB2 have been doing for uh, thus far for Azerbaijan is they've degraded Armenia's ability to defend. And, and as Mike was saying before, most of the gains so far have been in the south, right? In low-lying terrain where um, Azerbaijan can use tanks, can use mechanized infantry more effectively, they haven't really had significant gains in the northeast, right? In the areas or in the or in the eastern part of the border, which was the you know, most kind of well-defended area. Um, and that's also kind of more mountainous terrain. And so, you know, w- w- we're seeing both the, the advantages and some of the limitations of the TB2. And, um, you know, a lot of things we're seeing from the Armenian side, uh, they don't have nearly as much modern weaponry. They have some domestically made UAVs, but not nearly as effective. Um, but at the same time, in video after video that they're producing, they're still showing the, um, them being able to have really significant effects from old ATGMs, from old mortars and artillery pieces, some of which are from World War II, um, and just using basic, you know, d- d- uh, TDPs and defensive tactics that, you know, w- w- would not be surprising for someone that served in World War II. Uh, and like that, that includes just using IED on canalized terrain, using mines, um, registering, uh, you know, dead space with your mortars and, and engaging those effectively. And so, you know, what, what's, what's really interesting that we're seeing and, and, and you know, no, right now, as Michael said before, Azerbaijan is making some pretty significant gains in the South over the last week or two. Um, they initially they were having kind of more difficulty, but now they are they are having more success. Um, but it points to just m- that we have some very modern equipment being used, but at the same time, it, it doesn't necessarily mean you can translate those strikes and those kind of tactical successes into operational or strategic success. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing maybe that's changing now, but at least for the first couple of weeks, there was certainly a struggle, I think, on, on their part to actually translate all those flashy videos into you know more significant uh, success on the ground. Mike, you, you put your finger up uh, while Jack was talking, so jump in there. Yeah, I wanted to have a go at the modern warfare discussion. That's probably the one that interests me in some ways the most too. And I just what happened in the campaign, but the latter part of our piece tries to make tried to make good use of what Jack had written and some other people had written. You know, good debates got stirred about the efficacy of drones. The the never ending debate of, you know, is the tank dead? Is this particular system or platform dead? You know, is the armored knight dead? Should we bring that back maybe? Um, it, it, and so a few takeaways I'd like to make is one that, okay, it's very clear that this conflict is a arming event for certain things, which is that drones are going to diffuse much faster because of how cheap and accessible the tech is, how easy it is to export much faster than counters to them, modify air defense to deal with them or specialized air defense to deal with them. That's a much more expensive thing for a force than it is to actually gain the gain a drone full power, something that's really expensive, which is tactical aviation with precision, right? This is something that historically is an expensive thing to get. Most little small countries like Armenia and others, if you look at their tactical aviation, it's like four multi-role fighters and maybe 12 ground attack aircraft is about the kind of things that they tend to feel. Um, so this offers real capability to them. Uh, to me, what it tells us is, is, one, legacy air defense is just not going to be that adaptable to the drone threat. If you bought air defenses in the 70s and 1980s and you're going to write a little M modernization next to it, it's not going to deal with Israeli loitering munitions. I mean, I think a lot of us knew that. But at the end of the day, it's pretty straightforward that you're going to have to really get capabilities that deal with this. Second one is that the air defense support to maneuver ratio always needs a look. And as someone studies the Russian military, there's a force that has a tremendous support to maneuver ratio. And Western militaries do not. And there's a force that's a moving hedgehog with layers of air defense and electronic warfare. Of course, when Western militaries look at us and they say, wait, our air force is our air defense. I don't think our air force is going to sweep Israeli loitering munitions from the sky. Like, I don't think it's going to work out that way, right? So so that immediately poses some pretty big challenges for the people who don't have much in the way of support. Um, and, and what it says that modern militaries can't expect to conduct operations without casualties, right? At the end of the day, there's this implicit expectation amongst high-tech, very expensive Western militaries that all that's going to end up to, to a decent amount of protection. Um, and even against a small military, they're going to face casualties due, due to this kind of technology. 
But on the latter end, I'll make this intervention first. That, look, whenever you look at these wars, people who deal with great power conflict are starved for information because there hasn't been a great power war for 70 years plus, right? So you're constantly looking to other smaller fights through modern technology to try to see if you can learn lessons and if you can generalize from those fights. But you have to be careful generalizing from specific context, and you always learn things that aren't true in these wars, right? You learn some things that are true and other things that are not. And to me, look, this is still very much a one-sided fight from a much more powerful country that invested way more in the military capabilities than the other against a relatively unprepared opponent in terms of what they had available for air defense uh, and, and, and counters. We don't know Azerbaijani casualties, okay, because it's an authoritarian repressive regime that doesn't release any information. So you have no idea what the attrition cost has been on the Azerbaijani military in exchange for these, for these gains, and you're not able to actually evaluate combat effectiveness. Drones provide great video feeds. You know, Armenians don't have the same systems that give you the same live feed. So it's very obvious you're getting a stylized picture of the battlefield. Um, and I completely agree with Rob. Turkey is very actively a participant in this war, making an even more one-sided matchup. But most importantly, as you saw for a long time, the attrition that Azerbaijan was able to achieve was not translating to territorial gains, right? So like week two, you were looking at them having taken out maybe more than 20, 25% of Armenian tanks. And then having gained maybe 2.8% of the territory they were aspiring to gain, go, looking, going into week three. So only now are they actually able to translate that. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. But if people want to talk about drones or whether the tank is dead, I'm happy to have that conversation too, because it's inevitable. It's going to come back. It's going to pop up every time. Uh, Jack, I think you, you have some thoughts on that, or, or maybe you, well, you are the land warfare guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, are, are tanks dead? Um, the only reason that tanks are dead in any military is budget, um, because they're very expensive, not just to procure and to train uh, to use, but also to deploy and sustain. Um, and so I think that's why that is an ongoing debate, because when you're looking at balance of investment decisions, um, a lot of countries, particularly those that engage in uh, either primarily operate in complex terrain or who uh, engagement in expeditionary activities, uh, there's a concern about whether they're getting the return on the investment. Um, but we know absolutely that if you are going to assault a defended position, there is not much that's better than a modernized tank for punching that into that position. Um, and, you know, okay, a modernized ATGM will knock out a tank, but not one that has appropriate APS, that has reactive armor, etc. cetera. So, um, you know, tanks aren't dead, they're just expensive to use. Um, and in, in that sense, I think it's a bit of an, it's an unhelpful debate um, because it comes down to how do you want to bring about um, an orchestration of these different capabilities and mix the old ones with the new. Lots of the old technologies are perfectly valid, as Rob has already said. Um, and, you know, if you are using a fairly basic UAS system, that is well integrated into your uh, artillery fires structure, um, then you can suddenly start achieving pretty high levels of precision and responsiveness with some very, very basic MLRS systems, um, which is something that we saw in Ukraine, certainly. So, you know, I, I don't think that, um, that it becomes a force mag multiplier for some pretty old capabilities. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the tempo and how long this has taken and ground seized and that kind of thing, I think we're probably, um, I don't think I'm surprised that they didn't make much ground in the first couple of weeks. I mean, if you think about the campaign to liberate territory from Daesh in Iraq, you had the US uh, with a core level headquarters um, and all of the capability that that brought online, um, plus all the coalition states air power. And that took months and months and months, you know, that took five years, um, seven months, nine months to get in through Mosul. But Outside of that, I mean, I spent quite a bit of time in Iraq and there were plenty of terrain features that took a long time to roll over. Um, so if you have competent and well-motivated defenders, then yeah, this is going to be hard and gritty and dangerous and you need those offensive capabilities. The Armenians are well-motivated. I haven't seen much evidence of them pulling, uh, retreating or, you know, routing from positions. Um, and they know how to use the kit they have. Um, plus, they have a defensive advantage. So I think, yeah, Azerbaijan has taken pretty significant casualties, as you would expect when you're attacking well-prepared positions. Um, but the question for me is whether Armenia can uh, kind of stop the bleeding behind their front line. Because if they can't do that, 
then they are going to become less and less effective at the front edge. Rob, you're still, you're, you've been, you know, at least you know, privately in some of our conversations, you've been thinking a lot about, you know, some of the, um, you know, the infantry units for the U.S., you know, perhaps for other Western militaries, you know, looking at some of the things that are coming out of this, uh, of, of this conflict is perhaps lesson learned and things uh, uh, we could learn or perhaps even integrate to our forces to make ourselves more effective. Yeah. So, um, you know, w- one of the lessons is that, you know, modern warfare is extremely lethal or right? is extremely lethal, extremely fast so much accurate um, and, and overwhelming firepower. We, 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 you know, we don't typically use it. We haven't really used that in Afghanistan, Iraq, or other places because we, we didn't need to. But, you know, there's a video yesterday um, that Azerbaijan published. Uh, it, was a t- it was a TB2, and it looked like it was at nighttime, and it was, and it was looking at an Armenian um, uh, infantry unit that was moving over a field, and it looked like they had pretty good dispersion. And then it looked like there was a, you know, something like a battery fire from a uh, MLRS battery, and, you know, if, if you talk about BM-21, right, an old, old technology, but each of those launchers has, has 40 rockets. They can launch those quickly. And if you have a battery of six of them, you can um, essentially devastate, you know, a grid square very, very quickly, you know, within 30 seconds to a minute. Um, and and I, the same thing is true for, you know, a variety of, of U.S. artillery munitions. And so, you know, I was looking at it, just thinking, you know, we haven't really faced a threat that, that, that bad, but... Um, you can't make certain mistakes in modern warfare because if you can't, if you do, you can lose a battalion in literally a minute, right? And, and it's just, it is that quick and that lethal. And, 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 and so some of these things are just really important lessons to, to learn and you have to learn ahead of time because you don't want to learn them the hard way. Um, in terms of things, lessons for the, for the U.S. elsewhere, um, you know, Mike made a good point about UAVs. Right now, offense is, is cheaper than defense, and that's a significant issue. Um, and right now, you know, we, we've talked about before about the TB2s. But they're 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 cheap to pr- to produce, right? I think I think production costs might be less than a million dollars at this point. Uh, and so you know, even when they lose TB2s, even if they you know our, our Turkey has more than a hundred of them service, even if they lose ten TB2s in a month, right? And they're trading them for a Pontiac S1 or a Tor or what have you, uh, that's a decent trade for them because cheaper the production rate is is just, uh, sustainable, and they're not losing pilots. And so you know, basically they can sustain. A number of these losses over time, and it's and you know it's something they can live with, and it's something for us to you know think about because our our high end UCAVs they're more capable than TV two, but they're also far more expensive, and I don't think we we would necessarily want to start losing Reapers you know left and right, whereas the Turks can lose TV twos you know pretty 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 often. Uh, I mean I think this year alone, and you look at Idlib, Libya, and now the, I think we had at least one loss or two losses this week. Um, they've, you know, they've lost probably almost, you know, 15 to 20 of these things this year. And yet they're still, it's not affecting their, their op tempo in these places. Um, you know, I think for, for Western forces, uh, the, the TB2 is the, is the really the, the, the high end thing we're focusing on, but in some ways I think that's less of a threat to, to our militaries because the range is pretty limited. It's only, it's only as a max range of 150 kilometers from a ground station. Um, and so because of that, you know, our best way of neutralizing that is using our aviation or long-range uh, surface fires to destroy those uh, TB2s or C2 systems on the ground and getting that advantage, right? To destroy them on the ground than it is in the air. So in some ways, TB2s are less concerning to me. But the um, what, what the Azerbaijanis have is they also have, you know, we're talking about from Israel, they have a lot of loitering munitions, like the Harap, Harpy, Sky Striker. Um, they have a variety of those munitions they also have a number of long-range ATGMs, like the Spike Inlos. And Spike Inlos is a, is a 25 kilometer range, and you can put, I think, like eight of them on the back of a, like, essentially buggy, right, a light, light vehicle. And so, you know, the thing, what, what, when I'm looking at this, um, and I'm just thinking back to when I was an infantry, infantry battalion, you know, longest-range asset a Marine infantry battalion had was an 80, is the uh, 81 millimeter mortars, which I think I, I forgot the max range, but it's less than 10 kilometers. And when you're looking at Azerbaijan. Right, where you have loitering munitions, which again you can put into a truck. I think I think you can you can launch from like four or eight of the Harap uh, loitering munitions from a truck, and they have a range of you know over 100 kilometers, I think. Um, and in, and then the spike missiles would have a range of 25 kilometers. Uh, there's no reason that we can't necessarily have that at the battalion level in the in Western militaries, and they would give in, in battalion commanders in our organic fire support asset that would have you know that would double, triple, or quadruple. The current range that they have, and you know, I think when we, we talk a lot about um, operations and great power competition, 
And part of that is that if, if we know that opposing militaries have really capable uh, precision guide munitions and, and other type of missiles, and we want our units to, to operate in a more d- distributed and dispersed manner, well, they also need to have long range s- systems. And, you know, I, I think we might be a little uh, on, on adopting some of these systems because loitering munitions, look, they, they can destroy tanks, they can destroy air defense systems, and you can get some that are, you know, man packable. And you can have a you know a squad or platoon that can carry one or two of these, and then that platoon or squad then becomes a much more you know dangerous uh, um, uh, you know unit to opposing forces. And so I think you know th- there's there's something to look about the, the 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 expanding range of these systems, and that I think we should be trying to push these kind of assets lower down um, to lower units in the military to give them a more kind of capable uh, you know capable system that I think we're we're using right now. So I think, I think that's, you know, that's one of the big things. And then, um, you know, in terms of this infantry stuff, uh, and, and Jack talked about this before, a lot of this stuff reinforces traditional things. It, 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 it emphasizes small unit leadership. It emphasizes discipline. It emphasizes, um, you know, uh, training up junior leaders to be capable. Because, you know, we, we've seen video after video, including on the Azerbaijani side, of them walking around in platoon formations, like in a platoon file. And there's no reason you should be doing that when there's observation and artillery fire. And and we and I've seen a few videos of pretty large you know units of the uh, Azerbaijani side getting destroyed in ambushes or in artillery fire when they don't need to. And and, and I think a part of the problem is I I don't know enough about the Azerbaijani military to talk about this, but you know we try and emph- emphasize getting squad leaders and team commanders you know in terms of four man teams to be able to make decisions on their own to operate somewhat independently. And I think a lot of the military is still somewhat of a top-down relationship where platoon commanders make decisions, officers make decisions, and enlisted men don't. And if you do that in modern warfare, that means you can't really you can't disperse your forces effectively, and it means you are really, really vulnerable to all these new weapon systems. And so, you know, one of the things to me that, that we're emphasizing, I think, at least U- U.S. military, is that focusing on squad leaders is important. Focusing on dispersion is important, and then stuff at nighttime, you know. Right now with TP2s, the thermal cameras are very good. They can see you at nighttime, and they can see you clump together even in trenches at nighttime and hit you. And that means our guys have to be, you know, more disciplined about dispersion. About you know, if they're in a trench line, they've got some kind of thermal cover. It means not getting out to to pee in the middle of the night. It means those little things. Maybe instead of sending a convoy, you send one or two trucks at a time so they're a smaller target. All those kind of little things that can make you less of a target to all these really modern weapons that are, you know, really effective. Let's go one back time around because we got about 10 more minutes left here. So, uh, Mike, anything to add to that? Um, sure. Um, so probably what I would add is first, my takeaway uh, is that looking at this conflict, the things I'm able to generalize, at least for armed forces and the matchup I'm interested more in, which is kind of like U.S., NATO, Russia, uh, judging by what a military with a tremendous amount of fires and strike systems can do that's going to use drones for coordinating with those fires first instead of just flying them with UCAVs, Russia still doesn't have functional UCAVs, is that what we're generally seeing Armenia and Azerbaijan is going to feel like a Swedish massage compared to what you're going to get on a battlefield with Russia, right? And that's the reality of it. What it tells me is first, a lot of these armies' ideas about how we're going to disperse are just not going to happen. Like the sensors on these systems are so cheap and they have night vision, IR, and all these other things. I'm pretty skeptical about um, uh, dispersal of a lot of our platforms. At the end of the day, you have to concentrate either for attack. You have to mass for attack or counterattack. You have a hard time getting around this basic fact. And canalizing terrain is always going to be a real factor. And to me, the biggest issue, I agree with Rob, is distributing munitions. I think our Air Force and other capabilities can handle, ultimately, an air-based limited platform like the TB-2. At the end of the day, it's like a light attack aircraft. It has to land somewhere, it has to fly from somewhere, and it can be dealt with. So part of that is we should be getting the stuff. Um, The other part of it is that we need distributed protection, and probably um, some of our high-end air defense systems won't work, won't be able to field at all against these kind of systems whatsoever. In both sides seem pretty tactically deficient looking at uh, the way this conflict has gone on. Um, it'd be interesting to see what uh, what would happen if, if an adversary really used this kind of uh, drone operations in support of a genuine strategic operation with real operational thrust, a clear military objective, and was not particularly tactically deficient. Um, I'll make two points that are contestable. So first, 
it's very clear to me that at the end of the day, it's much better to have a much smaller ground force with proper air defense protection against these kind of systems and a much larger one, the way the Armenians fielded, but without. And, and Russians figured that out uh, right after Washington Desert Storm in 1991, that this is all, all this metal is just food for air power. That's all it is. It's just food for the air power uh, mill. There's no point to it without layered air defense, without all these support systems. Uh, the second one, kind of looking at it, I completely agree with everything Jack said. That's why I prompted him to tell us about the tank. Because of watching this, it's like, look, if you know a better combination of firepower, protection, maneuverability on the battlefield, I'd like to hear what it is. Looking at those, com look at the battlefield, it's very clear that the only thing worse than being in a tank is being outside of the tank, in a lightly skinned vehicle or walking around in nothing at all. That's definitely a less survival situation than the tank, as much as people may not like the tank anymore. Um, where you're probably going to have problems is, I think, with towed artillery. I think towed artillery is living on borrowed time. I'm increasingly skeptical watching this about the longevity of towed artillery on this kind of battlefield, especially with so many sensors and loitering munitions and capacity for either, whether it's counter battery fire, whether it's just the loitering munition finding you out in the field with your towed artillery piece and all your ammo around you and nothing's going to necessarily protect you from that. So I'm, I'm wary more of, about them and their mission. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave uh, time for my colleagues. Can I ask one question to both of you? Because, uh, Mike, you just brought it up. You know, one of the things that the Turks have been able to live with, particularly both in, you know, the, 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 the case in Syria made more sense because they were flying TB2s from inside their own territory. The Nagorno-Karabakh is a little more difficult for me to understand. I mean, well, I, I, can, I can understand it. But you would think that if these things were causing such havoc on the battlefield, that there would at least be some efforts to try and interdict them, like left of launch, you know, to use that phrase, you know, before they get off the ground. Do you think that this is a case of the Armenians not having the proper equipment? You know, one would think that they have at least some inventory or some capabilities to strike an airfield, uh, a lack of grids, a lack of intelligence, something along those lines, or they don't want to go there because of the potential escalation to bring in Turkey. It's a, it's a hypothetical question, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm meeting it at a time, but it's, it's something that I, I'm struggling with myself as I'm watching this. Uh, any thoughts on that, Mike, before I, 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 I let Jack go? Yeah, I think Armenians tried to do a little bit of that with their launches against Ganja and Ganja Airport with MLRS, but um, the best thing they could hope for is try to find maybe where TB2s are flying from. You're not really going to find loitering munitions. They lack the ISR. Their Air Force can't really fly because Azerbaijan has pretty good air defense, too, and Armenia doesn't have um, that much of an Air Force to speak of. Remember, they lost the Su-25 very early on in the conflict. They're not even, they're not even sure to what. That's why they said that uh, Turkish F-16s must have shot down from Ganja, but they don't, know, they don't really know what happened to it. Um, so my sense of it is that they try to do a little bit of that, but they don't really have the ISR and the ability to figure out where these things are flying from. Maybe other people have a different point of view. But in any case, loitering munitions can be launched from uh, road mobile systems. So you're not going to find them. Like, I mean, you, in the United States, we have incredible amount of experience with how difficult it is to find a road mobile system, a much larger one than the kind of truck you need to launch loitering munitions. So those are much easier to disperse, hide, and, and use. That's the biggest challenge. Um, the advantage is definitely on the side of the user of loitering munitions. Yeah, I think that's worth repeating before I turn over to, to Jack, is that the, the main we, while the main videos may be coming from the TB2s, it's the loitering munitions that are probably the more salient or relevant for this discussion. Uh, uh, Jack, please, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, so very briefly, I, I think one of the things I'd flag is how quickly uh, Azerbaijan has introduced new capability is something that we need to watch for, because there are a number of capabilities out there that have not really widely proliferated yet, but could do so very fast. Um, you know, Iskander's Rad 500s from Iran, uh, a whole family of missiles that the Chinese could start exporting, but uh, obviously LoRa, which we've seen, that is something which massively increases the capacity for accurate tactical long-range strikes by a military, which, if they were used against us, um, would interdict our airfields, uh, our logistics hubs, all the things that we rely on to sustain our force and to maintain theater entry. Um, and we don't have very good answers to defending against those. So I think that's something that we need to think through, um, that we are threatened in substantial depth. When you start thinking about other kinds of capability that could be quite easily exported, you know, if China starts exporting AESA radar, they make pretty good radar, um, we will see a step change in ISR capability among our adversaries. And what that means is that, um, going back to Rob's point, you have people who are not operating in a tactical way, partly because, I mean, obviously, Armenian and Azerbaijani TTPs have not been great, but uh, 
our people as well, when they're out away from the flock, the front line of own troops, and they think they're not under threat, will stop following those TTPs. Um, and I think the issue is, is that when you can start picking up dismounts walking in woodland from substantial ranges with, with radar, which you, you can now, um, those people are not safe. Um, and I think we need to, A, there are new TTPs we need to develop for that. Um, but B, we need to think through quite carefully what the psychology is for a soldier when you are permanently under significant threat. Um, not just when you're fighting the Russians, because the enemy can integrate capabilities where they can find you and hit you. Um, that, that has quite an important um, set of implications for how you think as a soldier, and I suspect how your morale um, and your sense of how much freedom you have on, in that operating environment. So um, I think there are a lot of things that we haven't necessarily seen in this conflict, but it has pointed to what is very much on the horizon um, and what could change very quickly if we really are in an era of great power competition where adversaries will respond to our expeditionary activity by uh, intervening and by sharing capabilities with adversaries. Just to find TTP for the listeners who aren't who aren't as uh, well versed with you with the acronyms. Uh, training tactics and procedures. There you go. Yeah. Okay, Rob. I think the final word is yours, and then I will thank everybody. So go ahead. Yeah. So so just to jump off what what both Mike and Jack were talking about there. Um, the last point, toughness, right? Will the fight? Those intangible factors are still completely um, relevant in modern warfare, and um, it, I think for Western militaries, we we have to keep training. Uh, our people to be tough and to be able to deal with this because uh, ultimately we haven't, you know, uh, I don't think U.S. forces have, have have been under real aerial threat since you know maybe the Korean War, um, and it's it is it's terrifying, right? And and you know the one thing one of the lessons I'm taking away from the Armenian side is that Armenians, you know, consistently keep saying they see they view this as an existential war. They see it. They don't think Azerbaijan, if they take back Nagorno-Karabakh, they'll stop there. And they think that, you know, ethnic cleansing is something that, that could happen. Um, that means they are committed to this, right? Even if they're losing, even if they're facing this really terrifying aerial threat, you're seeing conscripts, right? These, a lot of these kids who are getting killed are born in 2002. And you're seeing 70-year-old men, old men, who are fighting because they have a will to fight. And they, think it, it, they, they don't think they have a choice. And ultimately, that means, you know, that, that, that kind of intangible is really hard to factor in because usually we say, OK, there's, you know, a lot, a lot of times we use military force. We say, OK, we're willing to take this amount of casualties and no more. Well, when you look at it in, in these kind of terms, it changes that that completely. Um, what Jack said about the, about the flot is absolutely right. You know, and, and when, I, when I look at, you know, mistakes being made by, by Armenian or Azerbaijani troops, I, I don't see it as being something different than what, you know, we might do. Right. Uh, you know, you, you look at poorly trained uh, units in the U.S. Or, or, or British military, they'll make the same mistakes. And especially at nighttime. Right. When when, when it, you, you have a tendency to, to bunch together because you don't realize how close you are and you don't realize how good thermal optics are and you don't realize the ECR of these munitions. Right. Which are significant. Um, so all those issues are a big problem. And, and, and as, as Jack was saying, you know, even if you're 10 miles past the flot, it doesn't matter. Um, and, you know, like there was there's a bus in Vardinus, in Armenia proper, that was struck by a Harap Lurian munition in the, in the first week of the conflict, you know, that was tens of miles away from the flot. That was in Armenia. I'm sure they weren't expecting it, but they were under threat there. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, what, one of the other big things to talk about, based on what Mike was saying, um, when you look at the TB2 with the role they're playing, in July, uh, Azerbaijan had only Lurian munitions. They had these other, all these Israeli munitions, and it, they really used them quite ineffectively. They, they were destroying, you know, like, like basically like trucks or buses that, that weren't inhabited. And they, they were very few videos of them destroying, you know, significant targets. This time they're destroying those targets. And I think part of that is that TB2s are spotting and ID, locating and, and providing that targeting support. And then Lurians are now much more effective at destroying targets with that, that support from the TB2s. Right. And something that, you know, Aaron, you and I have talked before that when, when Turkey uses TB2s, they often use them in conjunction with F-16s or with their other, you know, aerial C-2 platforms. And it's, it's not just one thing by itself. It is a broad spectrum they're bringing to the fight. And when you when you combine all those things together, you make it really effective. And so TB2s, you know, one of the things we've noticed is that, you know, a lot of uh, Armenian um, air defense have been destroyed. Some of them, uh, a lot of the OSA AKs, OSA AKMs, Strelatins, 
and Krug and Kub uh, radars, a lot of them were destroyed by TB2s, but a lot of them were destroyed by loading munitions. All of the S300 targets were destroyed by loading munitions, we saw, and even one of the OSA, uh, OSAs that was destroyed, a TB2 was watching it from afar, and a loading munition hit it. And so, again, it's, it's combining those different platforms and realizing some are better for, for some missions than others. And, you know, in, in Aaron, something we saw in Idlib was that um, TB2s were being used to destroy Ponsiers, they weren't being used to destroy the books or the longer range Syrian air defense systems. And allegedly that was Turkish F-16s that are hitting those targets from within Turkish airspace from long range, you know, glide bombs. And so again, it's, it's still that aspect of, you know, one, one system by itself is not going to be perfect. It's not going to be able to solve everything for you, but when you use all these things together and you integrate them, that becomes a really effective uh, thing to a really difficult thing to stop. And it becomes part of that kill chain and I know that's the big buzzword about when we're talking about modern warfare, about how do you break up the, the kill chain? It's like, well, th there are elements to do that. But right now we're seeing, you know, that kind of the integration. And, you know, at least in my opinion, it's Turkey that's doing this. It's not Azerbaijan. And that's why they're so much more effective this time around than we're in July or in 2016. Um, and again, I think another part of that is you see that uh, um, having good weapons does not mean they're actually going to be translated into battlefield victory. It depends how you employ them. It depends how you, you integrate them. It depends if you have fire support maneuver. Fires by themselves aren't necessarily the most important thing. And so we're seeing, I think on the Azerbaijani side, now they're being more effective at that. I think early in the conflicts, there are a lot of strikes that you know were useful to degrading their main defenses. But now it appears a lot of these are right up on the flat and they're destroying targets uh, um, you know, either in anticipation of or during uh, assaults on those positions, and you know that that kind of integration makes it much more effective. I mean, gentlemen, this has been a fascinating discussion. I mean, I think there's there's more we could even tease out here. I mean, unfortunately, I have the hard stop, and so it's my fault the conversation's ending. Uh, but there's other lessons, you know, that Rob was talking about that they're similar uh, that you can pull out from sort of the other recent you know modern conflicts. Um, um, you know, throwing up there, whether it be in Libya, whether it be in Syria, now Nagorno-Karabakh. The, uh, the 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 compar the comparisons you can make because the similarity in platforms because a lot of them involve Turkey um, and, and some um, legacy Soviet or Russian systems. Uh, with that, I want to thank everybody for joining. Um, you know, Jack from London, um, uh, Rob, I think you're in New York, and uh, you know, uh, Mike, I think you're in the D.C. area, uh, and and me in Philadelphia. So we're we're all up and down the East Coast uh, as well as right across the Atlantic. So uh, thanks everybody for making time. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening, and uh, if there's more to come, perhaps we'll get the band back together and do another talk. So with that, thanks, everybody, for listening.